Christ, good people of God, grace and peace are yours this day. From God our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is the final week that we will spend here in Matthew 5. Part of the reason for this is because next Sunday is the Sunday of the Transfiguration. Traditionally, on the Sunday before Ash Wednesday, the church journeys up the mountain with Peter, James, and John to see Jesus transfigured in glory before embarking on the wilderness wandering those 40 days of Lent. So in order to get up that mountain, we can only spend one more week right here and now up this mountain listening to Jesus' most famous sermon. Conveniently, this is also the end of chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel, a convenient place to tie up our time in the Sermon on the Mount in a neat little bow. And since it is strange to preach a sermon about a sermon, and since Jesus himself keeps building on what he has said before here, let us remember that this Sermon on the Mount is not Jesus preaching to the crowds. Jesus is instead preaching to the proverbial choir. It is just him and his closest disciples up there on the mountain. So what Jesus is doing is laying out a vision of discipleship for them, a vision of a life transformed by being a follower of Jesus. He begins by casting this vision with the Beatitudes, and it's a vision of a world turned on its head, blessing the poor in spirit, calling the peacemakers children of God, comforting the mourning, satisfying those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Then Jesus shifts into descriptive imagery for the community of disciples. He calls them the city on a hill, the light of the world emphasizing that their lives of discipleship are going to be seen, observed as his disciples in the world. He then tells them that they are the salt of the earth, that those lives are meant to change the world. He tells the disciples that he has come not to abolish, but to fulfill the law, which is an echo of his own baptism, where he told John the Baptist that in that act they were fulfilling all righteousness. And then Jesus gets right down to it. He takes the law, the law that the people knew, the law that he had just said he had come to fulfill, and he amplifies it. He says, you have heard it said that you shall not murder, but Jesus says that anger is just as egregious. He says, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but Jesus says lust is just as harmful. He says similarly emphatic things about things like divorce and oaths sworn, and these admonishments are meant to emphasize to the disciples that they are a community of interconnected, interdependent people, a theme that continues to be emphasized as Jesus moves into our reading today. Now you may have noticed throughout this little excursion into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount the past several weeks that I have taken what Jesus says pretty seriously. I have not tried to explain away difficult sayings about things like anger. I have pointed out why he would say things about adultery, divorce, and oaths, but I haven't backed down from saying that Jesus meant them. That this isn't what God has in mind for the community of disciples. Because quite frankly, if God had God's divine brothers, these problems wouldn't be present in an interconnected, interdependent community of disciples because they wouldn't be things that exist. Now, unfortunately, because of human sinfulness, those are things that exist. And they have to be considered within an ethic of interdependentness and interrelatedness. An ethic shaped by the Beatitudes. Humbling the privileged and privileging the humble. Dealing with brokenness is really the driving issue for Jesus in the passage that we hear today. When Jesus deconstructs the idea of an eye for an eye, he is making it clear that retribution has no place in the kingdom of God. Now, St. Matthew might call it the kingdom of heaven. So let's say it again, just to make sure that it sinks in and we stay on theme. Retribution has no place 
and the kingdom of heaven. And let's be clear. The kingdom of heaven is not, some, not simply some faraway kingdom of God on a cloud that we will only see hereafter. No, the reason that Jesus is so insistent in this Sermon on the Mount is because he is forming his disciples into the kingdom of heaven right here and now on earth. And after making the point that retribution has no place in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says some more specific things such as his famous admonition to turn the other cheek. Now, these are very specific instructions for people living as Jesus' disciples did under occupation. Being occupied by the Romans, a Judean could be compelled to walk for a mile, carrying a message or a Roman soldier's equipment, but no further. Walking a second mile is not only killing them with kindness, as they might say, but causing one's own occupier to break their own laws in the process. Turning the other cheek when struck is yet even more subversive. In Roman hierarchy, a social superior uh, could backhand one of lower station. But if that person offered their left cheek then, the striker would be put in a bind he couldn't backhand with his unclean left hand. The choices are either not to put the defiant inferior in their place, or to strike with an open palm or closed fist. Both of those were reserved for equals. So that's off the table too. Not only would turning the other cheek avoid retribution, because retribution has no place in the kingdom of heaven, but it would also affect a resistance. Not only does Jesus preference nonviolence over aggression, but he does so in a way that tells his disciples that they need not remain entirely passive while they are being abused. The kingdom of heaven has no place for abuse. Then as chapter 5 rounds to its conclusion, Jesus wishes to ensure in a very parallel move to what he does earlier in the chapter, that his followers, his closest disciples, not only do the right thing, but also feel the right thing, think the right thing. You have heard it said, Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and your sisters, what more are you doing than others? If you're not even the Gentiles, do the same. Insert yourself into that passage however you need to. In today's divided political climate, both throughout the world and nationally, it shouldn't be hard. Who is your enemy in your mind? What sort of person do you see as working against, against your best interests? Love them. We said that again in case you missed it. Love them. Consider them ahead of yourself. Pray for them. And not just some snark factory prayer like the one I've heard so many times. May those who love us, love us. And for those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if God doesn't turn their hearts, may He turn their ankles. So we'll know them by their limping. It's funny, but it's not really praying for them. Now, another word about praying for your enemies. Be forewarned. It may not actually change them, but praying for your enemies, actually praying for them, changes you. God uses prayer to work on us much more than we use prayer to have God work on the world. Praying for our neighbors, even the ones we might not think of as our neighbors, causes us to see things from their point of view. Praying for others, especially our enemies, makes us develop empathy. Praying for others causes us to see them as God sees them. This would have been a beautiful place to end the sermon, 
but Jesus still has one singer left in him. He ends chapter 5 with this little beauty. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Some things of note right off the bat. First of all, Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the plural. As my southern friends might say, y'all be perfect as y'all's heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is addressing his disciples not as a collection of individuals, but as a collective. This perfection is achieved in community and communion, living as these disciples, lives that Jesus proposes. And this statement ought to also slap us right in the face with what Martin Luther called the chief use of scriptural law, that is to show us that we cannot achieve this law on our own. The refrain of this Sermon on the Mount time and time again is that Jesus' disciples are meant to form a community that is reflective of the kingdom of heaven, a communion of God's saints formed by the Beatitudes and centered on Jesus, each of them carrying the light of Christ into a world desperately in need of the hope and reconciliation that Jesus brings. This, brothers and sisters, is our calling to bear Christ into the world, to take that which we receive in bread and wine, the very presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, and let it change us, and through us let God change the world. The foundation of our faith is laid in Jesus. Through Him we are taught. We are taught to love our neighbors by the one who died for those who killed him. We are taught to forgive by the ones who said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We are taught compassion by the one who assured the thief on his side. Truly I tell you, today we will be in paradise. Through Jesus, we are changed. Through Jesus, we die and rise, dead to sin and alive to God. Through Jesus, we glimpse the perfection of God and we are empowered to bring the world that He proposes to birth. Right here and right now. Thanks be to God.